636. Um, I first question is, are there any additions or deletions from the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as shown. So second. second. Thank you. All right, all in favor? Oh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. At this time on the agenda, we have time for public comment. Um, some of you, all of you who would like to speak have signed in on a sheet and I will call you in order of uh, your uh, name on the list. And then I will take um, folks from the digital side who raise their hands. And um, great if we could try to get those in order. Um, oh, their hands raising up, but I don't know if that's possible. So whoever raises their hand will come up with the topic. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so I just have a few things to say about doing that. I will be the person who recognizes those who will be speaking. Um, you have um, a, a time to say what you need to say, but we would ask due to the size of the audience here and on the screen here as well, 100 people are on that screen that you would keep your comments um, on target, as well as if somebody's already said what you had planned to say, please do not re-elaborate that. Um, if one of the points of public comment, I'm going to just read to you from the statutes, order and decorum shall be observed by all persons present at the meeting. Neither members of the body nor the members of the public shall delay or interrupt the proceedings or the peace of the meeting or interrupt or disturb any member while speaking. Members of the body and members of the public are prohibited from making personal and pertinent threatening or profane remarks. And uh, I think that that's all I need to say about that. Um, we are here to listen to you tonight. Um, we'll be obviously recording the session and taking notes. And um, we will at the end of the meeting have an agenda, uh, an executive session to further discuss the things that have been raised here by the public. So um, we're here to listen. So the first person I think is Kirsten Oates and Zoe Hornet. Good evening to the WCUUSD Board of Directors. My name is Kirsten Oates, resident of Pomfret, Vermont, and along with me is Zoe Hornick, resident of Woodstock, Vermont. We will jointly use our allocated time for our prepared statement. Wednesday, January 25th, a fourth grader threatened the life of one of their parents. The inadequate and delayed communication that has been sent out from the administration has inaccurately hid behind privacy and FERPA. On January 30th, Superintendent Sosa, when trying to defend why there was no information, including safety policies, in her, in her email stated, quote, the challenge administrators face is that all of that information is protected uh, is protected by confidentiality rights. The Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act FERPA is a federal law that prevents school personnel from releasing any student information, including behavioral records, school responses, and or safety plans, closed quote. You are correct that FERPA protects the disclosure of parts of a district's safety protocol, like an evacuation door and a student's personal information, like a report card. But FERPA does not protect general information, policies, procedures, and the disclosures of whether there was a threat or nature of the threat. Tonight, we will speak specifically to the mishandling of the latest incident by outlining the following. Inexcusable communication, the silencing of children and exposing the lack of required published documentation of state mandated school safety policies by Principal Mills 
and Superintendent Sosa. Inexcusable communication. The parents found out that a child in the fourth grade had threatened the life of one of their peers by their nine and 10 year old children. Children, not the school administration. Even after parents started emailing Principal Mills on July 26th through the 27th, it wasn't until 1.55 p.m. on January 27th that any communication was sent to only the fourth grade parents. It took 48 hours, 48 hours for any school communication to be sent after the incident was reported. Silencing children. On Thursday, January 26th, one day after the incident, the children who knew the details of the alleged threat were instructed by Principal Mills not to discuss nor speak to their friends because that is how rumors are spread. She continued to silence our children that week when she spoke to the entire fourth grade, telling them not to speak of the incident to each other. She then summoned the original group of children back to her office on Monday, January 31st, to chastise them for speaking about the incident and continue to emphasize that they were not to speak to their friends about it. So not once, not twice, but three times she asked students of the fourth grade not to speak up. No matter what the intent of Principal Mills's message was, her words have created fear within our children, fear for their safety, fear to speak up, and fear to feel. No published state mandated public policies. The Windsor Central Supervisory Union was not in compliance with the Vermont Agency of Education Department of Public Safety on January 25th when the latest incident occurred. It is required by the state of Vermont that school policies must be published and accessible to the public. February 2nd, eight days after our initial request to review the policies and only after the Vermont State of Education was notified, did you comply to state mandates and post any of the WCSU policies to your website? It is clear to us and to many others, including members that are sitting here in front of us on the board, that there were mishandlings surrounding this latest incident. There are just, these are just some examples that we have witnessed ourselves. We sit here in front of you today to ask for immediate change. We're asking you to assemble an impartial oversight committee to ensure checks and balances when any safety protocol is activated, a commitment to communication following Vermont's education agency best practices to be adopted immediately. That means same day communication if any incident occurs. And then three, an official investigation of how this entire incident was handled and any related incidents leading up to this by an impartial committee, including law enforcement, teachers, board members, and parents. Our children's safety is number one and we expect their right to learn in a safe environment is prioritized. We urge the community here today to share their own experiences with mishandling of incidents and, um, and what you expect the administration and the board to do about it. As we all know, this is not the first incident of its kind at Woodstock Elementary, and unfortunately, it will not be the last. How are you all going to protect our children? Thank you. Thank you, Pearson. Karen, Karen, did you ask for a copy of that? So yes, yes, we will send. Thank you. In fact, it would be helpful to, for those of you who are reading statements, if you could give us a copy of those statements, that would be appreciated. Uh, Mallory Bennett. Thank you, Gary. Hi, uh, my name is Mallory Bennett. I have three kids within the district, one at Prosper, one at West, and one up here at the middle school. Um, I just wanna speak to the handling of issues that I've personally dealt with within each school. Um, last year, when I had an issue with a child that was continually bothering my daughter on the bus, I let it go for a while. I taught my daughter how to handle herself within these verbal communications within this person. And 
one day she came off the bus and told me that this child had grabbed her ponytail, ripped her head back, got in her face and called her an effing Z, among other things. At that point I had had it. I called Maggie Mills and said, what are we going to do about this? This is a serious problem now and it's physical and I'm done. And she said to me, well, um, that child has been spoken to and it's being handled. Okay, end of that. I can't ask what she does, what's going on, how she's going to handle it from here on out, on out. So I pulled my child off the bus because I didn't feel that she would be safe riding the bus just from West to Prosper. Fast forward to this year, I have you know three kids in three different schools. Cody Tancredi called me the other day and said my child had an incident happen. And to him, um, this was something super small, but Cody said, hey, this is what happened. Your son is okay. This is, you know, the child is going to be dealt with. I can promise you that. He didn't give me any specifics. And he asked me if I had any questions. I felt extremely validated or extremely heard. I felt like my child was safe and Cody was on top of manners that happened within his school. Um, Aaron Sinkamani called me again. And with my daughter being in fifth grade, she was on the opposite end. She was having some problems that she was partaking in that I wasn't approving of. He told me, hey, this is what's going on. How do you feel? What do you think we can do? And told me, you know, this is what we're doing at our school, that we're going to make sure that this this behavior is done. Um, I felt extremely comfortable speaking with him. I felt like things were going to be handled and I moved on. I haven't heard anything since. I communicate with my daughter and I know Aaron is there. When dealing with Maggie, I feel that my child needs are not really cared about. She's there to, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes me along and move on to the next because she has so many behavioral problems at that school. I have a child in, fourth, in third grade who was continually hit, slapped, pushed, shoved up against desks and insane verbal abuse. Nothing is ever done. Nothing has ever been done. I do not feel comfortable sending my child. In fact, I kept her home from school today. As you can see, there is a huge amount of people here. There is an even more amount of, or a bigger amount of people on the screen. We're all fed up and we need change. We've been saying it for long enough. Please, please hear us. What we're doing is not working and we're creating way more problems than we can control. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, Donna Lombard. Hi. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time, for listening. Um, I'm going to just read what I wrote because that's a lot easier for me. Um, so here we go. My name is Don Donna Lombard. My children have been attending Woodstock Elementary School for three years now. I'm concerned about the lack of communication between principal and parent. For example, I recently heard from my eight-year-old son, he has been to the principal's office three times in the past two years. I was never contacted by Principal Mills, and I find this extremely concerning. How are we supposed to work together if we don't know what is going on? Addressing parents and caregivers about behavioral patterns should be on the front line. I'm not asking for names nor records, just pure communication. What happened to the days where parents were part of the school community and how can we fix this problem immediately? My heart goes out to the teachers who carry this heavy weight. Um, I'd like to present this petition signed by parents asking for transparency and communication at Woodstock Elementary School. And I'm going to say this out loud. There are a hundred signatures on this petition. Um, I hope it's taken seriously. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Joe DeFore. Uh, thank you. Thank you for um, all that you guys do to the girls, women do for the schools. Um, my name is Joe DeFore. I have two kids in your system. Um, and we moved here because of um, research that we had done and see, we'd seen the legacy of Woodstock 
we had seen the legacy of Woodstock High and the, the kids who had, where they had gone, what that what had become of them. And when, when we came to Vermont, we specifically chose this area and specifically did not choose other areas to bring our kids. And for the reasons that a lot of other people out there are looking at right now and have been for the last couple of years. Um, you know, the last, I think that all that, I think that legacy was paved with, by the feeder schools, by the Prosper Valleys, the Barnards, by the elementary school at the time. And that, that part of the, the system, that beginning first steps, what happens there dictates what the high school is going to be like in, in eight to 10 years. And I think you have something on your hands right now that's bigger than you know. And I've spent three years here listening to my kids tell me stories about what goes on at West. Three years with my daughter begging to go to a different school. And three years of these kids telling me, Dad, you're the grown up. I'm a kid. I just want to learn. Their learning environment is being held hostage. She says it's like daycare. There are 20, she, they said the teachers can't even get their instructions out. 25%, 75% of the people are sitting there trying to get something done, and the teachers don't have the tools somehow to get this done. But at West, another thing that she said, was adults need to fix this. And I really came here because, you know, it's my first meeting, but I, I've been having this inside of me for a long time. And you just can't just up and move and go somewhere else. We want this community. We like this community. And we want to be able to recommend this community. Other people are speaking with their feet. There are teachers that have been here for one and two years that are leave, deciding that it is better to teach somewhere, that they need to teach somewhere else. I don't know the reasons, but for whatever reason, they are deciding to go. I know two parents, I know two kids that are driving 40 miles every day. They left this year. They couldn't take it any longer. All right? they, they just couldn't take the, the school environment. There's something going on, and I think it's at West, that where I think the adults need to fix it. And I think the adults that are involved in this process at any level are there or here or anywhere and that they don't or don't or cannot fix it, I think they need to step aside. And I'm saying that because I, this next, we're at a crossroads, I think. And there are a lot of people who are, who are on saying the same things that I am. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not the only voice out there speaking with urgency. Something has to be done now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you to the board. We felt so lucky to move to Woodstock to raise our child in this town, in these schools. What we have experienced so far in our child's school has been a mix between caring teachers and staff and absent administration, creating a huge impact on her learning and overall social emotional well-being through daily interactions. On numerous occasions, we have raised concerns that our child has shared and asked to help and support around over experiences of racial remarks, violence, and various behavioral concerns, all to be quickly dismissed. All of these scenarios came first from our child rather than the school. On several occasions, the incidents have warranted further discussion with the school, and we have asked for additional community resources and support to bring knowledge and expertise alongside these major traumas happening within our school community, only to be dismissed over and over. Several months ago, our eight-year-old child walked off the bus, the same bus, mind you, of last week's reported violent threat, which included a gun. She walked off with an unfired bullet in her hand. We brought it to the, directly to the school administration and were asked to wait while the principal finished a meeting, even after messaging why we were there. Our child was scared. We were scared as parents. 
We ask repeatedly for action steps and broader safety and prevention messaging to the wider school community in the wake of the recent gun violence across our nation. We were told that this is not what the administration is being advised to do and nothing was communicated further out with any family. Our child had feelings of nervousness, being scared, getting someone in trouble. She was told in the moment, you did a good thing. But after that, the only ongoing support came from within her household, from her parents, as with every incident reported over the last year and a half that she's endured. In 2022, gun violence surpassed car accidents as the leading cause of death for children zero to 19 years old. And yet the events outlined above appear to have caused no greater concern for broader action from our school administration. This has been true for other situations we have brought to the school's attention, when our child has repeatedly been picked on for her skin tone, when she had a fist raised and her front of her jacket pulled, and repeatedly hands put on her unwillingly with physical impact by classmates throughout the school day. All of these repeated incidents, not isolated, have been shared and communicated to us by our seven and now eight-year-old, never from the school. We have had to hold and guide all of these conversations alone without support. Our child is engaged with many social and extracurricular activities across many communities, and we experience none of what is mentioned above. As parents, as community members, as an educator, as a clinician, I am scared for the traumatic events that continue to happen to our child and the children at West that go unsupported for these traumatic and violent acts. These experiences shape a child's future, They impact their learning and development, their overall social emotional wellness. And when this happens over and over, they can impact their future health outcomes. We have noticed a switch in our daughter over the last several months. She feels less connected with her school, her teachers, and the environment as a whole. We are thankful for the staff and the teachers who have listened, who have continued to support our child and all children at West, but they cannot do it alone. It is time to revamp policies and procedures that are relevant to the current landscape of our society, designed with evidence-based strategies and developed alongside input from parents and caregivers and teachers. I know the school is asking for parents to help given the staffing shortages. However, I would think that this needs to be paired first with policies that can protect students prior to the onboarding and training of parent support roles. Given the extreme range of behaviors that we have concerns over, Asking for the general public to come and help seems inadequate, especially in spaces where behaviors are higher, such as recess duty. If there are budget constraints over increasing professional support roles, such as child psychologists and behavioral interventionists, then it should be requested. I feel parents and caregivers would be better suited on task force or advisory committees. I am sad and empathetic for the families who have withdrawn their children from West in a lack of a response, remediation, and support. I am hopeful that our voices are heard and change will happen. I am hopeful that we can be more proactive and preventative in 2023 and take a less reactive approach for the overall wellness of our children and our community as a whole. We are asking for positive change that is actionable steps. We need to start with furthering the conversation beyond tonight with community voice and strategies towards improvement. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Holly. Um, Beth Harper. Hello, school board. Our family has been in the Woodstock system for 13 years. My daughter is a senior and my son graduated last year. Maggie Mills was our principal in our last year at West and our experience was positive. I've also known Sherry Sousa since she was integral in implementing the summer soap program. So that goes back a long ways. And I've been impressed with her leadership and communication as superintendent, especially during COVID. I serve on a parent council established by Sherry to enhance communication and understanding. And I felt good, very good about what I've seen throughout our district, especially in comparison to what I know is happening in neighboring districts. Not unlike others, since 2012, I've thought about violence when putting my kids on the bus every day. I now think about it every day as my daughter drives to school. 
I think about it at band concerts, at assemblies, at basketball games, where I scan the bleachers for unusual or unseemly activity, and even at the graduation service last summer. <laughs> These threats are not going away. If weighs heavily, then a nine-year-old could be threatening others' lives. If there is access to weapons, the likelihood of violence is real, regardless of the age. I don't know the exact sequence of events or details that transpired last week. I read what was presented in the Vermont Standard, and I read the correspondence from Sherry that explains legal limitations of sharing details. Not knowing the whole story is infuriating because as parents, we wanna know that everyone is safe. And we wanna trust that the school is appropriately responding to threats and minimizing risks. It is really hard to blindly trust. Without information, it can feel like the rights of most to be saved are less valued than the rights of those who threaten. A teacher and a board member have resigned for lack of information and lack of trust. I hope that your board would not fuel further fuel divisiveness by further pointing fingers with accusations and rhetoric. Based on my experiences, and perhaps some of that blind trust, I believe that Sherry and Maggie's responses were roughly appropriate, though less than perfect. I'm not sure it's reasonable to expect perfection for a horrifying threat that defies prior experience. Is there room to improve communication to parents and staff within the constraints of the law? I think so. When an event happens, there has to be immediate acknowledgement that there has been a threat. Details can't be disclosed, but parents, staff, and students need to hear from and be assured by the administration. It is infinitely more upsetting to hear rumblings than to hear facts. Therein lies the delicate blind trust. This situation has presented Sherry, Maggie, teaching staff, and the board with a chance to retool, rethink, and improve communication. Collectively, we're fortunate to be given this chance to improve all aspects of the protocols. I ask the board to please share those improvements, news of those improvements, so that we can all feel increased confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I have a I'll just repeat that those of you who are reading statements, we really would appreciate that you send copies along. If you have one to give us tonight, that's fine too. Thank you. Uh, Darcy Blanchard. Thank you all for hearing us tonight. Uh, I am a parent of two children in the elementary school and one child uh, in the middle school. In the elementary school, I have seen a persistent pattern of incompetence in management of behavioral issues and allowing a culture of bullying. I am so sad to have to be talking here tonight after the most recent gun threat and how it was handled. A couple of points about this incident. Maggie Mills met with the whole fourth grade the day after the report was made, telling them that they were all safe, even if they didn't know what she was talking about. She then instructed anyone who knew what she was talking about to go with her for a private meeting. In this meeting, she instructed these students to not talk to anyone else about it. She made comments including, I don't want rumors being spread. Anyone that doesn't know about this doesn't need to know. People who do need to know about it do know. We need to keep this conversation in this room. These kids were then torn about even talking to their parents about this, which is never okay. Thankfully, they knew better and they started opening up. These kids are brave and they knew to do the right thing despite being told from their principal that they should keep quiet. When parents were finally notified of this incident two days afterwards, it was only in vague terms and with no details on exactly what happened or how safety was going to be ensured. By then, many parents had already learned of this incident through their kids. Students were notified that their teacher would not be returning at about the week mark of this incident, and again, before parents were notified. The student in question was also allowed to return on that day, and that presence caused real fear. The directly impacted students were not even warned that that student would be returning. When students voiced that fear, they were told that they can't share any of the details of the safety plan, but it's there and they're safe. No additional details are shared with parents, and our kids still feel unsafe. 
I'm sad to say I don't have confidence in the administration's ability to ensure safety right now. I'm scared for our kids. Student behavioral issues are not being handled. Process and protocols are being hidden behind a privacy shield. Students with multiple violent incidents are allowed to return to school. Student, report, student reports of behavioral issues, both emotional and physical in nature, um, nothing is done about them. With this recent issue, there was a lack of action and communication to parents with a direct threat, significant delay in contacting police, conflicting accounts of safety plans. Students are not being supported and they're being told to keep quiet. There is a lot of room for improvement while still respecting privacy and parental involvement. There are some serious inadequacies that need to be addressed immediately before any more damage can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Darcy. Arlana Rouge. I'm, thank you. I don't have anything prepared. Um, I just wanted to listen and I ended up putting my name down. So <laughs> um, I do just want to make some comments um, before I do share my own personal experiences. Um, I think that um, we can all agree that mo most of our social um, shortcomings and our faults are through our systematic issues with transparency and with um, red flags not being exposed or pulled. Um, and um, I have a son in fifth grade in Prosper Valley. He went to West for one year last year, fourth grade. Uh, there are similar experiences as to what I've listened to tonight of um, things that he would come home and stories that he would tell and how he explained the, how it was dealt with um, was unfortunate and I was never, it was never communicated to me, I would never get emails and there would be other students involved, but nonetheless, um, issues, physical issues that he expressed that he felt didn't get dealt with. Um, and kid friends of his that he did have fear for that he was scared of their safe scared for them and felt like they weren't safe and it was repetitive issues um just a common a common thing that he would say is that it wasn't dealt with just these repetitive remarks um and i do want to also say that i personally took him out of barnard for the same issues that were, he had physical violence and he experienced with a number of kids and it was the same situation um, where there was, it wasn't dealt with and I communicated with teachers, with principal and I moved to West for that and experienced some of, some of the same experiences um, and I think that transparency is is important it's really important and I understand too with the pandemic and with staffing shortages um, things are hard and that's what I have to say I'm sorry, it's not organized, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Alana. Uh, Cliff Johnson. Thank you for hearing us. And, uh, I'm not going to deliver my points because they really echo a lot of the points parents have raised already. But I would just say, as a parent, our trust is completely broken at this point. And 
especially silence and children and expecting them to fend for themselves at you know pre-k to four three is is not acceptable so uh, I personally, we're waiting to hear what the response is, and the longer time goes on, you know that that becomes more unacceptable. So hopefully, as the board and as administration, as a the the people, I feel the hardest part is the teachers because they they've been extremely helpful as much as they can, but clearly they're also being silent. So something needs to change. That's it. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, Ryan Townsend. Good evening. Uh, I want to speak more on the policies in place that has allowed this most recent incident of the threat to even exist in the first place. As you all heard, for well over a dozen people already, plenty more are going to be talking soon. There is a lot and lots and lots of uh, bullying, abuse, violence uh, happening in our school system. It seems to be more common than not to be just one particular school and one particular leader that keeps getting involved and silencing people. I don't understand in a world where we encourage everybody to see something, say something, speak up, how our own leader of the school would then pull the kids aside and silence them. That is absolutely disgusting and very disheartening. Not to mention this in particular kid that was the victim of this death threat is a special needs child. And as my niece, I know her very well. When she first came to Woodstock two years ago, she had trouble at her previous school of fitting in and being accepted. All she wanted to do at West was be friendly and make friends. She used to get up excited, have herself dressed and be waiting for her driver to pick her up in the morning. It has been common over the past two to three months. She has learned to dislike and even dread going to school. And she would come home crying, wondering why she couldn't make any friends or why people wouldn't help her when she asked for help. And time and time again, this in particular kid that made the threat, uh, had bullied my niece many, many times. We brought every single complaint and incident to Ms. Mills to a no mail. Every time she said she was handling it, there'd be a new course of action. And yet the next day we would send my niece to school and she would be bullied yet again by the same kid. The behavior was never stopped or corrected. And if anything, it continued to escalate to more serious events that I am not allowed to speak on today because everything's a secret here. As my, as a parent of three in this school, and several other parents behind me, there should be no secrets about my child. There should be no secret about anybody's child. Every parent has the right to know their kid is safe when they go to the school. Nobody here feels that. And this is just a small portion of the parents that go to this school system. We turn our hopes and prayers to you guys because you're the only oversight there seems to be here. It's a very clear picture on where the issues are. And I really hope you guys do something about it, please. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Tammy Myers. I too have nothing prepared to say. I put my name down in case I wanted to talk. Most of you who know me know that it's really hard for me to be quiet. Um, so, I, like I said, I don't have anything prepared. I do have a, a question that keeps just going around and around and around and around in my head. And that is, how, how can we be, and I, we as a community, be more proactive 
in these kinds of situations. It's not a matter of if this happens again, it's a matter of when this happens again. And I have to hope that we will do better. We are lucky that this didn't turn into something much scarier than it is. Um, I hear a lot of, I hear a lot of scared voices. I hear a lot of scared parents. I was scared when I heard about this through the grapevine. Um, as a mom of four who have, who have, one has gone through this system and three are still here. Two are still very young. Um, this is scary. And I have to, I'm an educator, I'm a special educator. I understand confidentiality. I understand that we can't give details. I also see information from other schools around issues like this that allow schools to get ahead with clear communication. And I'm, I'm hoping that we learn from this and we can be better from this and that communication is better and protocols are in place and we know what to do. We know how to speak to our children. We know that we can trust. So my question is, and my wonder is, how can we be more proactive so that when this happens again, we are in a better situation? Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Betsy O'Neill. To the members of the Windsor Central Unified uh, Union School District Board, my name is Betsy O'Neill. I am a resident of the town of Woodstock. I am writing this letter as a mother of my child who is in third grade. <clears throat> I'm writing this letter to express my concerns regarding the recent events that have been happening at West concerning the lack of communication in a timely manner to the West parent community regarding threats of any kind on the school campus or bus boats. We recently received a brief communication about the findings in the newsletter from Principal Maggie Mills on February 5th. While this communication was helpful, which I appreciate from a parent's perspective, I wish the communication happened in a timely manner within the first 24, 48 hours of the incident, instead of receiving details from everywhere else especially for minor children throughout the entire week of the incident. If this incident occurred on January 24, why are we receiving communication about a possible threat 12 days later? I am respectfully requesting that someone from the administration be made available to provide answers to these questions and concerns. As a parent and educator within the, your district, I am not asking for you to disclose any information that violates any PII or PERPA regulations or details about the students involved or the incident itself. It's not something that we would like to know. However, a quick email informing parents or just this example, an incident, quote, an incident that happened in our schools and we're working on details that will be communicated after the fact that are known or will be issued, closing quotes. A simple communication like that will be appreciated. It will stop the drama of rumors and it will enhance the level of trust in the wise leadership team. Unfortunately, many of the parents in the community, including myself, found out about this event through the media in the Vermont Standard a week after the possible incident. This is troubling for a parent of a student in your care. Our superintendent sent an email prior to the article on January 30th, which was confusing. I wasn't sure if the letter was pertaining to my Woodstock Union High School building. That communication was vague and not provided in a timely manner. We were told that the vagueness was due to PERPA. Nevertheless, when prior incidents have occurred on the bus or West Principal communicate issues to the community within 24 hours, and you can see that in my letter um, uh, on the back, on September 30th of 2022. 
this timely communication was appreciated. Likewise, our high school principal sent a communication to families, students, and faculty in May of 2021. And it's right there on the in, in the package that I provided about a possible threat, which it was helpful. We're not asking for our leadership team to violate a student's confidentiality. Effective and timely communication of a, or any of all threats on a school ground will allow our community to understand the nature of a possible threat without hearing about such through a grapevine, which leads to uncertainty for the entire community. It appears that a teacher resigning function as a whistleblower to our community when all this possibly could have been avoided by simply communicating to the parents in a timely manner of possible threats that are being investigated by the school administration. These are questions that our school board should consider. It also appears that we're having issues with bullying at West and within our district. This is not the first time I am being made aware of bullying attacks, insults, and physical assaults in the boss line or the boss itself. My child has been the victim of bullying on the bus at eight year old with a swollen hand and crying how brutal it is to ride in the bus to the point that he no longer wants to take the bus, which means I must leave school earlier than usual to pick him up at West. My family said it was necessary for him to take karate classes so he can defend himself in the event nobody does it, which he happened in this past incident. When my husband and I brought this uh, boss bullying matter to Miss Mills, we felt that the response was okay, but my child is still afraid to take the bus today. I'm trying to balance the after school pickup for my child in addition to my responsibilities as a teacher here in the building to limit my nine year old son anxiety regarding the bus. The policy regarding the responses for bullying is outlined in the principal's discretion as detailed in the handbook for the elementary schools in 2020 to 2023 West Behavior Expectations Procedures. Given the recent anxiety and uncertainty that this is community is trying to manage here tonight, perhaps it will be a good idea for a school board to propose additional rules and standards to make parents aware of any threat and or bullying issues. The parent and guardians of any offenders at school or on the bus roads need to be held accountable and responsible for their actions by either extending the suspension of the bullying child taking the bus or at school for more than two weeks, depending on how many times the same student causes incident. With respect to the bus, perhaps more adults in the room might have a positive impact on the students who rely on the bus transportation by having school personnel randomly take the bus in order to provide some sense of security to other children who are behaving. Maybe consider having the principal or an administrator of the signal riding the bus once a week on the buses where issues are being raised. These are techniques that I have observed from other schools and, and districts from where I work in the past year in Vermont. We have a beautiful community here in Woodstock, and these issues are manageable with the proper control in place. We as parents and educators need to come together to find out the standards for all involved in order to maintain the safety and learning environment for our student body, which will help ensure the level of trust from within our community. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you to all who have spoken so far. And now I will open it up to those who are attending via Zoom. There is one hand up. I'm afraid I cannot read yeah. It's Malena. Malena. Malena Egan, would you please state your name and town, each person that speaks? Hi. Sorry. Yes, it says Jack, but it's it's Malena Egan, uh, Bridgewater. I'm a parent of a second grader and a seventh grader in the district. I'm also an educator. Um, thank you for listening to us today. And thank you everyone for sharing all of your stories. Um, it's not easy. Um, I guess what I wanna share today is, huh, it's a very emotional topic, um, but um, it's a little bit on both sides, the educator side, the parent side. Um, I echo a little bit of Beth Harper's um, statement so i'll try to stay away from that a little bit um tammy brought up some points i was going to bring up as well but basically um 
on the bullying side, we dealt with that with Maggie. And she was great throughout that whole process when we were dealing with it. Ms. Klosik was amazing. The whole West uh, staff and administration helped navigate us through that in a really amazing way so that our daughter now has flourished and she is doing really well. <laughs> um, so I thank them for that. And so I kind of want to remind myself and others who have hopefully also had a positive experience with Maggie and the staff at West, um, that there is value in that talent in those seven years of principal. And I think she also, no, I know she does also have um, years of classroom experience and that is invaluable. I know it has not been perfect, but as Beth pointed out as well, it is very hard to be perfect in this type of environment. Um, Maggie sent out a letter to the community last night and she basically said, kids do and say things. And I want us to remember that too, because I don't wanna downplay what happened at all. I don't, because it was serious and I don't wanna minimize it at all, but kids do and say things. Um, and they have for a long time and they will continue to do so for a long time. And so how we react to it is super important. And I can remember seven years ago, we put in place um, the one-way mirrors on the windows at all ground levels at West. So seven years ago, we were already thinking about safety because of, <laughs> excuse me, the state of the world and how things are. And now fast forward to today, we had this happen. So procedure, policy, structures are in place for the safety of our students. But I also want us to remember that every time our students walk through the doors of our schools, they are bringing with them their personal lives. And those personal lives merge with the professional lives of the people who work in those buildings. And that's hard. <laughs> it is so hard. They have to manage those behaviors on a daily basis. Every day, no matter what happened at home, those kids, they don't know how to leave it at home, how we do when we go to work, right? They bring things to work. And our teachers, they're pushing content but they're also managing behaviors every day. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that, you know, they're pushing education, but they're also managing all of that other stuff every day. And so Maggie is in meetings every day. That's not her fault. So I think what we need to be asking now is at the board in budget situations, what can we do to support Maggie and the staff in those buildings through budget to make sure, what do we need for the safety of our students? Do we need more boots on the ground? What is it? What do we need? So that those safety procedures that we do have in place, that we have had in place for so many years are effective and are um, safe for years to come. So as a community, what can we do to help? I think that is what we should be asking. Hopefully that makes Thank you, Thank you. Uh, I cannot see who the next person is. Kathy Peters. Hi, um, Kathy Peters from Comfort. I just want to um, just bring up the point that a lot of this has to do with transparency. Um, and there was a comment from the board earlier that you're going to discuss it in executive session. I think it's really important that there are more public meetings to discuss this problem, because once you take it into executive session, discuss everything you want to discuss, come out and give us some information as to what you're going to do. That's more of the problem about dealing with things behind closed doors, saying it's all better, but no one really knows. Um, that's really hard as a public 
to swallow that everything's going to be okay, but you're not going to show us anything about it. You're just going to do it all, all in the back and then bring out a fancy cake and say it's all better. Um, this isn't something new. The school is currently in a lawsuit regarding bullying in the middle and the elementary school. So you've had ample time and your budget right now does not include any stipulations for additional support to try and get this bullying problem under control. You had school board meetings, I think it's been two years now ago where the students from the high school said that every single one of them that came to the school board meeting was scared to go into the bathroom because of the amount of vandalism. They sat here and told the board, the chair of the board then told the students that that wasn't their problem. It needed to be dealt by the principal and it is still an ongoing issue of vandalism in the school. So this has been a problem for a very long time and it's something that needs to be addressed out in the open, not in executive sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Andrew Cleveland. Uh, Andrew Cleveland. Hi, uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, all I really wanna add is my own personal experience with having a student at West. Um, I have a kindergartner there who in, in November, he was what I'd like to call bullied on the bus um, on the way home one day where a group of four-year-olds decided they thought it would be okay to teach him. I won't say it out loud, but it was pretty inappropriate. Things that he said, they told him to tell his parents, his principal, his teachers, and to say it over and over again in his mind uh, so he would never forget it. Um, I address this with, with Maggie Mills and I was told it was handled. How it was handled, I don't know. Um, I was told by my son, some of the, like an apology was made, things like that. So fast forward two months, or I'm sorry, two weeks, two weeks, um, he was, lined up in the bus line after school, waiting to get on the bus. And uh, another student, probably a grade or two ahead of him, started slamming into him with his side, like nudging and um, saying some derogatory statements and then eventually telling him that he was going to choke him. Uh, my son's a kindergartner. He's forming his entire view of school right now. And this was just in the few months, the first few months of school starting. That to me was very concerning. It's still concerning. I will say that Erin Klosek, she was phenomenal in her response. She emailed me almost immediately after um, the second incident, the, what I, deem the more serious one. Um, I do appreciate that, but what I'm having a hard time grasping, and even now I'm physically upset by it when I talk, talk about it because my son, you know, he came home and I sat him down and I said, you know, I, I heard about what happened. You know, I wanna know how you're feeling about that. Like, what were you thinking? And he said, well, you know, I was really worried. And, and, you know, the things that I taught him about when to ask for help, knowing the signs of when it's something that you can't handle yourself, um, he immediately did call out for somebody. So I, I told him I was proud of him for that. Um, and, you know, some, I think Aaron or another teacher that was on duty that day at the bus line, they kind of, you know, migrate around, they're milling around from place to place because they can't be everywhere at once. Um, but somebody did come to him when he yelled out for help because he was genuinely scared. And in the email from Aaron, it did say that 
she could see that he was noticeably upset and jarred by the comment, um, which was entirely unprovoked. Um, I'm not sure who the student is. Uh, my son seemed to know his name, but not who he was. He just knew that he was older. Um, I do know on the bus incident, they were all fourth graders, but I, I would want to say that this was even a, maybe a second or third grader that made this uh, comment that he was going to choke my six-year-old son. Um, but when I sat him down and asked him about it, he said, yeah, well, he said he would choke me. And I said, well, you know, that's a really unkind thing to say. And he said, yeah, Dad, because if he did that, I would die. And I'm sorry, but my six-year-old should not come home saying that he felt that he was going to die that day at school, that, that there was a child there that wanted him to die. And it was deemed, uh, you know, a, not a joke, I would say, but the, the kid said he was joking. He was confronted about it. He said that um, he was just kidding and that he didn't intend harm. Um, whether that's true or not, I mean, kids could say that <laughs> they don't want to get in trouble. Um, they could say that because they were really joking or they maybe were partially joking. Um, but I do know is that whether harm was intended or not, there was still harm. My son was harmed, even if he wasn't physically choked or physically harmed. It, that's something that he felt and he's still feeling because it is a topic that continues to come up. Maybe not every day, but I would say not even three or four days ago, somehow it came up and the comment was made about the, what happened in the bus line. To the point where I mean, he's almost long forgotten about the, the bus incident when he was riding the bus and the kids were urging him to say some really explicit things to his family and his, his classmates and his teachers and his principal and so on. So um, I don't know what needs to be done, but something really needs to be done. I mean, it, my son should not feel like that nobody's child should feel like that whether it's a kindergartner or a fourth grader or a 12th grader it, it, it it's a little ridiculous and you know I do praise again Erin for her response time for telling me um I the bus driver told me about the first incident in November um and then the following incident was in December but the the bus driver brought it to my attention and she wasn't fully aware of what was said, but she knew that there was an incident. Um, and I was the one that actually, I think the bus driver did mention it to, to Maggie or somebody at the school, but uh, I think I believe I was the one that had to initiate a email after a phone call with, where I didn't get a call back. Um, I then had to initiate an email to Maggie Mills to address the incident and have a conversation about it. Uh, I understand she's busy. I'm not saying that you know, she's putting me off or, or anything like that, but, um, but the response on that was was a little lackluster. Um, but the second time, I think the, the severity I, I think was realized and um, that I have no idea what happened after that. I have no idea um, if, if the student was disciplined appropriately as far as, I, I don't even know what the protocols are for those types of things, but it's in in my child's mind, it, it was a death threat. It was a threat to his life, to his safety that he still thinks about. And it's somewhat still ingrained in his mind. So um, I think that's about all I have to say about it. I don't know what needs to be done. I do believe that there needs to be some things in place, and I think we all should agree and push extremely hard on a solution that we're all happy with as far as feeling that our, our children are safe when, we're, when they're out of our hands and in the trust of the school. Thank you.
Thank you, Andrew. Ann Jones. Hi, can you hear me, Carrie? Yes, we can. Hi, um, hopefully you can't all see me, um, but I popped in. I um, wasn't even really planning on attending this meeting, but as some of you know, I'm a big community member and support this community in many ways. Um, I will be short and brief. I've been in the school system for too many years. I have a 21 year old who's at NYU, um, a senior who is back at Woodstock High School and going to St. Lawrence next year. And I have a 13 year old who is in eighth grade at uh, Woodstock Middle School. I probably was your longest serving parent at Woodstock Elementary School and uh, was involved in many transitions, changes there. I served on both uh, search committees for principals for Karen White and Maggie Mills. I would just like to say briefly that I support all sides of this conversation. I hear Donna, I hear Mallory, I hear Tammy, I hear Melina. We are in a hard situation. I comment to my husband a lot that the school environment is so, so different than when Izzy, who's now 21, was in kindergarten with Luke Fisher. Um, I've been in the school a lot working. I've seen the changes. I've seen the challenges that the teachers have. I've seen the challenges that the principals and administration have. I've seen the challenges that the parents have. I think the words transparency are key. I think we need to remember that we all need to communicate. There's not enough communication. I agree with the parents who are saying that, but I want us all to remember that we are all on the same side here. All of us are wanting to educate our kids. We are wanting to bring them into adulthood and be better people. And I just, I'm happy to be here tonight and hearing everything. And I appreciate all of you. And I just, I think transparency and communication needs to be better within our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Jen Harris. Uh, Jen Harris. Hi. Um... So I just, uh, just a couple quick things. Um, um, I have a daughter in um, <clears throat> second grade um, and a son in pre-K in the elementary school. And I just, um, you know, obviously we've, we've all been thinking a lot about this over the past week, no matter how we heard about what went on. Um, I haven't been sleeping at night and I'm sure many other parents um, are in the same boat. Um, I just find myself feeling that um, it's it's here, like it's it's come here, kind of, you know, like for so long I've been watching things on the news. We all have, and um, just feeling so thankful that we and naive, I guess, to a degree that we we live in this wonderfully safe community. And so, um, anyway, what I'm hoping and in addition to what everyone else has talked about today, one of my big hopes here is that we don't brush this aside, what happened, and that we we realize that every situation from Sandy Hook to what just recently happened in Virginia, there were signs and there were, um, whether it was someone posting on social media or having a side conversation with a classmate or, bringing an object to school and scaring you know scaring a teacher whatever it was there were signs and my plea to everyone is that we just don't ignore this and and sort of brush it aside and recognize that it could be a sign and that we however it, it's being dealt with it just I just don't 
I'm just, I'm scared. And I think a lot of us are. So I wanted to say that. And I just also wanted to say that I'd love to be part of the solution here to some of the stuff that people are talking about. So um, my daughter has experienced a bit of the bullying I've heard people raise today on the bus. Um, you know, I'd love to help. So if we want to get a committee together of parents, teachers, wh whomever, um, I, I, I would love to be part of that and try to come up with ways we can make a difference in, in, in the bullying and the, um, you know, the other things that were raised, you know, violence, et cetera, that were raised today. So I, I think, I think a lot of parents want to take part in this if we can. That's, that's it. Thank you, Jen. Uh, is there anybody that would like to speak from the Zoom group? If so, you could raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. I'd like to say a few things if I can. I didn't put my name down yet. Is it possible? Sure. With Dr. Um, Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to say a few things. Um, and so, um, you know, with regards to the, the recent threat of violence, um, when I first heard about it, I guess through some other parents and, and rumors, and then eventually some communications from the principal and the superintendent. Um, I thought that the communications from the administration were you know, said almost nothing, and the um, citing of FERPA as as the reason I thought was not valid. Um, I've been in education for my whole career, twenty something years, you know, in the college environment, and so dealt with you know FERPA and other uh, regulations a lot. Um, I think that the administration should be. Um, Acknowledging the need to share information, and if there are lawyers involved, saying to the lawyer, you know, how can we share the information we need to share while complying with the law, and not using it as an excuse to uh, to avoid saying saying much. Um, part of the reason I wanted to say that is because I think for myself, and I probably speak for other people too, we don't really know to what extent policies and procedures are in place and to what extent they were or were not followed. So it's hard for us to be involved and propose change or try to create change and make things better. If we don't know where the problem lies, and do we need better policies and procedures? Um, do they already exist and they weren't followed appropriately? I mean, we have very little oversight. Um, and I, I think that's kind of where we need to start. Um, also just say, I mean, this, this meeting was very eye-opening for me. I, also heard about many bullying incidents. My kids bring stories home, um, but I am really kind of shocked at, at how widespread it is, and it's more more than I realized. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, if there are no other comments to be made, um, I'm going to. Can I say something i don't know how to raise my hand okay from that What's your name, video please? i apologize and your name is kara defor i just wanted to say something about pbis and um how i feel like it needs to be reevaluated in particular the data collection because i i don't know that it's an effective program I think there needs to be accountability and ability to um, kind of work more intensely with kids that need to be controlled. And I'm not sure that that program has those tools or I don't know, um, is being followed in a way that would provide those tools. Um, I sat on the PBIS leadership team just for a few months as a parent leader, actually just for last year. And it didn't seem like data was collected in a way that was valid at all. Different teachers may or may not do it for 
different types of incidents. And I don't know what other data you all have to make choices on, but I, it's not for me just transparency and communication. It's also wanting to make sure that tools are in place to get help to the kids who really need it, but not allow them to overpower everybody else's needs because my kids really want to learn. I know a lot of other kids too, but they certainly all want to feel safe. Anyway, I just wanted to add that, that I'm not sure if it's just communication transparency. I think it might be a problem with sort of what, I, I'm not sure that positive behavioral support and interventions, if it's not coupled with um, a more, more interventions that provide accountability. And I'd like to know a little bit about what people think about that and what the board's role is as an oversight organization, if you all participate in those decisions, and if not, who does, and how, how does it all work? But that's about it. And um, thank you all. Thank you to my kids' teachers, um, in spite of my kids both, you know, feeling disappointed a lot and not I don't think they've been the target of bullying. They've certainly witnessed it a lot. But they, like my husband said, really are unhappy about being in the schools because of so many behavioral problems that take up so much time. And it just creates a toxic environment. Um, so I, I would like to see it change, you know, really the whole climate and in terms of being more of a, learning environment. And again, thank you to their teachers in, in spite of everything um, and also some of the staff. But uh, I know that their one teacher does have good control over his classroom and it and it's just sort of um, events with bullying that are going on. And the, the other one, I think, you know, it, it's hard to do that if you don't have the tools. So I want to make sure that the the proper programs are in place, policies are in place so that teachers do have the tools. Um, I'm not sure if PBIS is that or not, and I have no idea what the program is at um, TPBS or beyond, but I, I do know that the data from PBIS is just really, really inconsistent. And if I were to hear arguments saying the number of incidents or the types of incidents, uh, if it comes from PBS, I, I think I'd be quite skeptical. Um, I, I don't think third and fourth graders in particular need pom-poms or other kinds of like the snow equipment coming and have like erasers passed out and little doodads to make them feel good. I think they they really need to be safe where there are positive, there is a lot of positive feedback, but that there are also means for, you know, addressing more serious problematic disruptive behavior. Um, I didn't have this prepared, so I hope I'm um, sort of being clear, I did write a letter that I sent to the chair and to my pomfret representatives, and I would request that that be distributed to all of you. Um, or I would, you know, I guess I could just send it to all of you. I didn't really know who else was on the board. Um, and um, anyway, I, I would hope that there's some kind of time frame also as a result of this meeting for, for setting, an, setting a plan in place. Um, will there be an assessment of what kinds of programs are used for behaviors? Will there be a time frame for doing an assessment and saying, okay, we're okay with what we've got or we're not okay? You know, how, how is it all gonna work? Um, I guess, okay. Yeah, I have something. To say. Thank you, Kara. 
I have something to say. Thank you. I, I've been on this school board for, I don't know, it's even 12 years or 15 years, I forget. I'm from Killington. My name is Jim Happ. I'm a representative from Killington. I have three daughters that have gone through this school system from kindergarten all the way through to 12th grade. And I've all three of them have gone off to Smith College. I'm kind of shocked at hearing a lot of the bullying. Maybe we haven't, maybe I haven't seen it over in the school I went to. I don't know if it's, I don't know what the reasoning is, but um, what I have learned in 12 to 15 years of sitting on this board is that there are rules and procedures in here for everyone on all sides. This is the first, like I got a, an email from a reporter the other day asking me, and I basically said, I will be filled in tonight. I wrote the email back and I included the chair, the vice chair, and the superintendent. My job is when I run for a school board member is to not get involved into the everyday thing, especially since I don't have children here at this time. So I'm here tonight. I've listened about an hour and a half, and we're going to get to the point of, you know, going over and over. It's very serious. I understand. But we have to go and do our part and start questioning what we've heard. That being said, I see this agenda that's in front of us tonight, and we all have fresh in our heads what we've heard for the last hour and a half. And I really think it would be a disservice if we like then just say, okay, let's move on, okay, and go to this here. So we asked earlier on for to accept the agenda that may be amended. And I think now what we really should do is like, you know, there's resignations here, there's minutes here, something. And I think we should get those out of the way like quickly and then do what we as a board, like it or not, I heard the one person say you go into executive session. It's it's the way it's been for since day one of me, even 12 or 15 years ago. And, you know, if we just start shooting things out here, I have to get answers. Okay? I've heard, I, I didn't hear enough when I say that. And when I say I heard enough, I, I heard plenty for me to ask questions. And it's the way the board runs. And I'm really sorry about that, but that's how it runs. And, um, you know, it's time for us just to do a couple of little tiny things here. If the board would accept my motion later on to make an uh, amendment to the agenda, I think what we should be doing is. Um, Why don't we end the open session here, the open comment session? Oh, yeah. And then... yeah. Okay, so I will make a motion to end the open session of the public hearing. Second. Um, favor of I, 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 would, I, I would like to make a comment here um, on behalf of the board members and myself um, and say that we have listened to uh, many difficult things to hear and there's a lot of questions that we all have. Um, some of us came here tonight with very little information. Some of us came with maybe a little more information about the last week and a half. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, good suggestions such as a, an oversight committee perhaps to be put in place, a review, that there be um, community voices involved in this and that um, we be a proactive board and community not a reactive board. Um, that our, we are working with policies actually that will be coming forward around safety and so forth. Um, that perhaps PBIS needs to be amplified in some ways to be more effective. But the overarching thing that we've heard is communication is needed and a, a swift communication. So we are taking that message from you all very seriously. Um, you're more than welcome to. Um, continue uh, with emails and conversations, but I would like to assure you that this will not be brushed aside and um, it will not be just an executive session only. 
but we as a board have to uh, talk amongst ourselves. Some of, some of the board members will be changing after this meeting, and so new board members will be coming on, and we encourage those um, out there that are interested that it is a proactive way to work on um, improving our schools. No school is perfect, no teacher is perfect, no parent is perfect, no child is perfect. We live in a very different world than we did 5, 10, 15 years ago when my children were in school. Some of the same things that you've brought up tonight, my children experienced as well, but certainly not to the degree where I feared for their safety. So I thank you very much, and um, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but um, at this point, we'll close the comments. The comments are closed, and um, those of you that did prepare le letters and statements, please forward those to uh, Raina Bishop or uh, Ben Ford or myself, uh, Carrie Bristow as the chairs. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, before I make the motion with the rest of the board here, and you know, this is my last full board meeting of a 12 or 15 year term. I wish it could have been on a lot better terms or whatever, but this is something serious. When I look at this, I just really think, Sherry, that you know, the consent agenda, the minutes and the resignations to to move to move to that. And that would be Carrie's decision. Well, uh, okay, so Carrie, okay. So are you just suggesting, and, and, Jim, that well, we not have the reports? Well, I'm saying right now, let's take number seven, okay? And get that now, and then this board get moved into executive session. And depending on what the conversation goes with, I don't know, we may be in that conversation for another hour, hour and a half, and... If we can come out and finish the rest, then we start to come out. So I really would like to do number seven right now. I think we could move through pretty quickly. I, for example, at the superintendent report, my report on the packet, I would defer to the packet. Well, I'm going to make a motion that we move number seven to number four, and then we move executive session to number five while it's still on all of our minds of what these folks have said and instead of getting into everything else and then trying to remember what was said. If I have a second, once again, I've been on the board for 12 to 15 years, I can get voted down now. My motion is to move number seven to number four and then number nine to number five and then come out and continue after we get through that part. That's my motion. If I don't get a second, and if it doesn't pass, I'm a big boy. And I've been on board for too long. I'll second it to open it up for conversation. I, I uh, am sympathetic to the idea. Um, I, I don't think that. Uh, I don't, I don't think I'm going to forget a lot about what was said. I mean, I know I've been, you know, thinking about this a lot over the last week and a half. And I think that it's, it's pretty clear a lot of the things that have been repeated. Um, so I'm not sure if it's um, necessary to do that. Another option could be to just, uh, as we go through the agenda quickly, understand that we could maybe truncate some of the items or table some as we get to them. Um, and I only say that because there are some folks like the students and folks who have their prepared pieces who are here waiting to give so, their presentation. So, that's so just I will say that number five, the time scheduled appointment has been moved to the March meeting. So that will not be happening. I know that Sherry um, and some of the directors were simply have a report that they've written in the paper and they're prepared to speak only briefly to those things. Um, and the students are here. Yes. Uh, I guess I'd uh, prefer to keep the agenda as is for two reasons. One, there's a second public comment. If we go into executive session, we'll have to kick everybody out. 
and there could be folks here who you know would like to speak again. Uh, I don't want to make them wait around the hallway. Uh, and then secondly, um, during the consent agenda, I had some very nice things to say about uh, Jim and his departure. I'm not going to say that. I mean, we were all trying to get out of that. <laughs> I didn't know if you could come up. That would be the trick. <laughs> You know, it, it's just my thought, and like I said, I'll call the question, and it's when I say call the question. Has his hands moved. Who has his Bob, oh, Bob. 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 Yeah, I think we should um, uh, not vote this amendment. I think we should stick with the agenda. I don't think an executive session is needed right now in this meeting or even after this meeting. Instead, I would ask the chair to publish each and every one of the letters submitted uh, at the meeting, get the minutes published so that we could have a full reading of everything that everyone said, and then consider moving forward from there. But um, messing with the agenda as written right now is a bad idea. I'm not in favor of it. Thank you. So, like I said, I'm a big boy here. I'd like to call the question over. That being said, I think I'm one of nine folks out of an 18 for person that just sat through here uh, that may not be on the board or rerun or whatever. Um, so if you want to follow that suggestion, then I would invite all of you back again in uh, March because uh, some of us may not be here. And I just thought I would take this opportunity to do this, but I call the question. And no one wants to. Those in favor of amending the agenda say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Nay. Let's go. All on right, we'll re four. continue with the superintendent's report. So I'll defer to the packet if there's information in there. Um, I don't think there's further information that needs to be spoken, so I'll defer to the rest of the packet. We can speak in more detail later. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Um, from the Director of Technology and Innovation. Yeah, I'll, I'll defer as well. All right, thank you. Um, student Service and Support. Thank you. Um, from the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. I encourage everyone to read what I wrote in the packet and thank you to all of our teachers and principals for all their excellent work on literacy. And the Finance Director. Same as Jen, I encourage you to read what's in the package, read some attachments, email me if you have questions about the budget documents. And uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, and finally, we have our student representatives, um, Aiden and Owen are here. We'd be happy to hear from you, Aiden and Owen. Um, I, I can start. I don't know if Aiden wants to say anything. I'll be brief. I think high school students are uh, overall doing pretty well at the moment. Uh, if I were to add anything, I would just say, um, you know, maybe on the other side of the coin here, just to be unbiased, I as a student really appreciate the level of input that I'm allotted by people like Superintendent Souza. Um, and I, I'd say just, you know, to, to balance out everything, all valid input, um, that would be my my input is, is how, how grateful I am to even be, be recognized here, so. Thank you, Owen. We always appreciate what you contribute to our knowledge. And Aiden? Um, yeah, Owen basically just summed up what I was going to say. I feel that on the high school end of things, uh, things are pretty good right now. Uh, we have a lot of good um, high you know, hopes and students right now with athletics and other events going on with clubs. Um, I also want to say that just input wise, like Owen was saying, I think that high school students are very involved with a lot of policy and a lot of communications around the school. I know that we've done a lot of work with that this year and gone a long way from where we were last year. So I'm really appreciative of that. And coming from different school communities too, I'm really happy that we have gone that way on the high school level and we're starting to see that more kind of opening to students to be involved and for communication to circulate throughout different, you know, different sub bubbles almost of uh, the school environment. 
Thank you, and we look forward to your um, your presentation with the the, um, uh, the TPBS students next month. Thank you. Um, committee updates, finance committee. Uh, just briefly, uh, we did hold a meeting, um, and uh, we got some information sessions coming up on the budget. Uh, we won on the Thursday before the town meeting. Uh, we get a Zoom invite for that uh, March 3rd, as a reminder, for anybody who wants more details on the budget. Um, Elliot and I will also be going out to uh, Plymouth on the, uh, right, by Zoom on, uh, on February, uh, February 20th to do an information session. If there's any other towns who want to do something similar, we'd be more, I'd be more than happy to um, do a single town-specific presentation. That's it. All right, thank you, um, Elliot. Yeah, um, we do have one policy, just uh, just to uh, the uh, the packet says it's a first reading, it's actually up for adoption. That's the new build um, tax impact uh, reduction policy, which has been brought up several times. Um, essentially, it's a policy to mitigate the tax impact of the new build of the high school, middle school, uh, and uh, middle school on the community by sending an annual cap and committing to alternate funding sources. Um, this was uh, tabled in January for further discussion. And at that meeting, uh, we uh, at our last meeting on January 24th, we decided to take no action but to amend the policy and we're bringing it up for uh, adoption today. We need a move to adopt. I'd just like to get confirmation that it's not happening at that meeting or whatever. Serena? January 24th. I don't think I was at this meeting, but the motion actually for adoption, if I wasn't. It was, and if you look at your formal agenda, it does say yeah. adoption on the warrant agenda. Yep. Yeah. So moved. Second. I have a question. Yes. Chairman Ben Price. So to the 16 or whatever board members here, when you look at this, policy and it says that the objective of it is to keep the tax increase to no more than 16 percent um other than the people that wrote the policy the rest of this reading the policy someone please explain to me what your idea of this is is because in the policy itself it says 16 percent and then later on when we go i'm sorry to a regular legal document underneath definitions it talks about the words in there and it brings you to that it's only good for houses that are up to four hundred thousand dollars so every single one of these towns so income included, where a house may be at 395,000, 300,000, or even those that are fortunate enough that have a house for $500,000, we're going to hit a reappraisal in the next year or two. The state of Vermont will give anyone that has income underneath, I think, $120,000 or whatever, they give them prebates and rebates up to the first $400,000. So if you think this is going to hold somebody's taxes to 16% and your house is currently whatever, and it goes over 400, you're gonna be now taxed 100%. So we talk about keeping people in our communities. And I know there are a lot of people in Killington that have houses or condominiums that are under 400,000. Because of the pandemic, people are buying places for double the price. We're forced to do a reappraisal in 2025, and those units are gonna go to $650,000. So for the first 400, they'll get their pre-bake and their rebate, and then anything after that, they will be taxed 100%. And you don't get a prebate rebate. So some folks that may only see a $1,000 tax bill, now will see a tax bill for, let's say, $1.60 or $1,600 for 100000 
And if their house goes up to 700,000 from where it is, they will see them having a tax bill for the first time of $5,000 plus. And I don't know if any of you other folks on this board really understand what Act 60 and Act 68, 68 did and some of the changes. So we're talking about trying to raise a population in our middle school, high school. And I think what we're doing here is false by telling people that their taxes will only go up 16%. And if you read this document further, it says that if it goes higher than 16%, they will find cuts elsewhere. So when you come back, and I'm not on the board anymore, and some of you might be here in two years, and you're faced with the tax bill going up 40% on somebody, and they say, you told me 16%, now make cuts to your school budget. I just sat here listening to an hour and a half of folks telling us, and one of the biggest things is I think maybe we've made too many cuts over the last 12 to 15 years while I was on the board, and there's not enough staff in our classrooms. You know, you're, this policy is just a policy to try to, I'm sorry, pull a wool over someone's eyes thinking that your taxes are only going to go up 16%. That's it. Bryce? Yeah, can then I, I just want to, so I think that in some regards, Jim and I shared some concern over the policy. Um, I went to the policy meeting that would happen a couple weeks ago to express the concerns. Um, you know, what Jim described is 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 true, right? Like 16% is not the absolute number. What we talked about, and my fear of having a number in there at all, um, was because it's so confusing, right? It's complex for all of us. Um, on the flip side, you know, there's there's a lot of people whose income are under certain amounts that they aren't going to realize this amount, right? There's people that are paid pay less than there's people that are paying more. And the number and the reason why it's in here, I, I totally understand, is because that's the controllable number, right? Because there's a number, and then there's all these calculations to the state to do with common level appraisal, to do with a lot of different things, to do with income-based things, to do with your home value. And um so I realize it has to start somewhere. So even though I, I, I have a little bit of an issue with the 16% being in there, what we talked about, and I think the, the policy committee was gracious enough to, to kind of come to the conclusion is that it's not so much the intent. The intent does not bother me. It's just the education piece. So, um, you know, if this if this comes up for vote, I am going to be affirmative for it. But I, I just think that as we move forward with any we need to really make sure that the public is educated. It's, it's definitely a big education piece here, and it's going to be a large effort of the board to make sure people, uh, like in the scenario that Jim described, know that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, so I think the board is one that to call out that this policy, if it goes through, okay, but then it's really a responsibility on all of us to make sure the towns and all of our communities really understand what that tax impact means to them as an individual. Yeah. Uh, sure, Bryce stole some of my thunder. It, it's really it's about messaging it correctly. It's it's not what Jim described. It, we're not telling the public that your taxes will never go up by more than sixteen percent. That's not what this policy is. It's a policy that is it's a pro forma analysis. It says what would the tax impact be before the capital was raised for the school, and what would the tax impact be after the capital was raised for the school. It's not, it doesn't, the, the issue about common level appraisal is not uh, relevant because we're just trying to say, if we build a new building, it could have this much of an incremental impact on taxes. And this policy is intended to incentivize the district to raise alternative funds, primarily private funds, to offset that increase, because we know if we try to put the entire impact on the taxpayers, that it would unlikely uh, that we'd unlikely get a, a bond passed. So I, I think that the idea of committing the board and the district to raising money to build the new school 
so that we can limit just the impacts from the new build uh, to the 16% gives us uh, a, an opportunity uh, where we could get a bond passed and we could see a new school, school building built. So I, I do support the policy. I'll just briefly, uh, echo that and say it, it, it what it does is keep us accountable to that fundraising and that that um, cap on the amount that the impact will be on the taxpayers. Yes, there's education that I know I need and many of us will need to understand how the 16% translate to your personal situation with all the various things that impact um, your tax bill. But the 16% is a is a real number and, a, and a, a specific point of accountability for the district in terms of their fundraising. Thank you, Corinne. Bob? Yeah, I second what Matt's uh, assessment of this policy is. I think it sends a real message that we're serious about looking at all options for raising funds to minimize the tax impact on our taxpayers for the new build. Um, so I think we should go ahead and approve this policy. And I thank you. Are we ready to vote? I, I get two oh. times, right? Yes. That's what we said in the beginning. What I've heard from three or four fellow board members just proves to me once again, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Okay, you really don't. You're telling people that the taxes aren't gonna go up to 16%, but this is this is pulling wool over people's eyes. You're asking for a policy to be heard in place to go to a vote for a bond. And what you're saying is if the population goes up and you're starting a base of 1,100 when you only have 1,004 in the school district right now, then you're also saying that if we raise funds, okay, it will only be 16%. But if you don't get the kids up and you don't get the funds, it's 32 to 36%. And then once again, in the definition where it's hidden, it says representative taxpayer impact means for any school district fiscal year, the percentage of the homestead education tax rate for a homestead with a grand list value of $400,000, income of $150,000, and excluding all of the factors impacting each calculation as of January 1st, 2023, and as thereafter adjusted for inflation, attributable solely to the repayment of capital debt. I don't want to sit here and brag to you folks. I make well over $150,000. I do not get prebate. I do not get rebate. I do have friends in Killington that do. Okay. This program, if you don't come out and tell them straight, why you don't be just straight up front and say, we need a new high school for X reason, and it's going to cost you X. If we get the funds, Later on, it will lower it. But currently, okay. your taxes are going to go up after your reappraisal, folks, another 30 to 40 percent. Thank you. This Jim. is Paul. Yeah, I know. And this is how, and this is one of the reasons why I'm getting off because you get quieted down. I have my two minutes twice. Thank you. Thank Amen. you, Jim. Um, anybody else would like to speak to it? Are we ready to vote? Those in favor of the, the adoption of the new build tax impact reduction policy, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. aye. And please make sure that my nay is in there because I know sometimes you don't have to put it in. Was there a second nay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, is there a buildings and grounds committee report? I think Joe will tell you he went through a negative 27 day to 30 below up at Killington. I'm the chair, or was the chair up until the end of today of buildings and grounds. And um, here we sit talking about a new bill while a lot of our elementary schools are also failing too. So exactly. I think we take care of every building 
Uh, I just want to say I uh, recognize the uh, B&G folks who helped out all weekend to uh, correct all the problems we had. We actually had a flood in this very room here uh, about 24 hours ago. And it was dry and things are repaired. So pass off to those guys. Uh, sincerely, I appreciate all their help. And uh, the door's open and the heat is on in every school. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, negotiations, hiring and retention committee, is there a report? No, please. All right. Um, are there any working groups? Oh, um, actually, yes. Um, I'm on the, the only sole member of like what was the communications committee group way back when. And um, I'm also the person who has the email address for the CEC, um, which is the communication committee uh, email through the WCSU. And I'm the one that has the access to like the listserv and stuff like that. Um, I know Raina has, spoke, has said it a couple times now that got to ask her to post things on behalf of the SU or the school because then she gets the emails and then she then has to, they go forward through her then to the board um, and that it's instead board, which I'm happy to do. Um, I'm just saying that if you want anything posted to the serve on behalf of the SU, please email the CEC at WCSU.net. Um, and, and then I will make sure. And I think at one point I got one recently that was like time sensitive, please do. And I uh, it's also appreciated when I have an idea of what the timeline is. Okay. We'll put something out right. So and if anybody know. else wants to take part in any of those, I'm happy. In the reorganization. Yeah, I'm happy to share the but also don't mind doing it either. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move into the consent agenda. I'll make the motion to accept the consent agenda. Sorry. All right, that includes minutes. Minutes, the whole consent agenda. I'd just like to, uh, if anyone has whose resignations or to go on. Yes, we have um, some resignations. We have a resignation letter from John Hansen, who is. Um, going to retire uh, from public education. He's been the principal in Barnard and in um, the Prosper Valley, as well as Reading currently. And um, although I don't personally know John, I know he's brought a lot of great things to the schools that he's worked at. And if there's another person who would like to speak about John, uh, they're welcome to speak. I'd just like to say John has stepped in on a number of occasions and has been such a strong leader. He was in place when we first had to move um, students from Prosper Valley into Woodstock Elementary. He was able to support us as we had other uh, physicians moving on. Um, I appreciate John's energy and enthusiasm. I often found him on the playground when I went to meet with him um, with students and very actively engaged. He will be greatly missed. Um, I do tell him he is younger than I am, but he's welcome to retire. <laughs> He is maybe one of the only administrators that has been a principal at every single one of the other. Every other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on the other side of the yeah. Like, I don't as long as I could, but Gary wouldn't. <laughs> he told me once when he wanted to go there, Gary. I told him to stay on this so, side of the hill. So flexible, literally during the pandemic. I don't know. Okay. Can, you, okay, can you go here? Okay, can you go here? Two okay, <laughs> can you be two principals at two different places? Yeah, I'll try my best. Okay. Yeah, every, everything that Superintendent Sousa said and, and fellow board members is completely true. We're disappointed to lose uh, Principal Hansen um, and so grateful, like you all said, for his flexibility uh, throughout the years. Thank you, John. And please note that we accept his resignation with regret. Um, another resignation in the packet is from Mary Dolan, the Killington Elementary School counselor. And perhaps you would like yeah. to say something about Mary. I would love to say something about Mary. Uh, we're, first of all, we're going to miss her um, terribly. 
She um, is such an attentive listener to her, her colleagues and especially to the children. They love her. They always want to go have lunch with her. Um, she's like the mother of our, our building for all of us. Um, but not only do all the children love her and her colleagues love to work with her, um, we feel very supported by her. And um, she is our PBIS champion. She definitely um, has, uh, has, is the data guru for us at, at Killington. And she brings data to us monthly on behaviors. And um, I'm so gonna miss that. She makes sure that we're looking at data as we form action plans um, to make a, a great, healthy environment for all of us at Kettlington. So we're gonna miss her terribly. I think she's irreplaceable. Thank and you. was a school counselor at Reading Elementary for a period of time too. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to ask that we uh, note her resignation with regret as well. Oh, we have, no, oh, no, we have some. <laughs> all right, and Jim is just trying to move us along here. That's all right, because he's not going to get moved along yet. Um, we also have three board members who, um, for various reasons, um, will not be returning to the board. Um, the first person that I'd like to say something about is PJ. DJ and I have had many missed coffee dates and we still have to do that and have our time together, but um, she's brought some great ideas to the board. She's um, a parent on the ground and she has um, is a very energetic person with a lot of uh, irons in the fire and we will miss you, PJ. We do have a, a gift for you. <laughs> They show you getting yours and not mine. I wouldn't hope it's mine. <laughs> ben is going to speak to the second resi uh, resignation or stepping down from the board. Jay Moore is uh, is stepping off from, from Plymouth. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Jay, I'll, I'll accept your award since you couldn't be here tonight. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you. Um, since since Jay uh, you know showed up in the area as we have our you know this this mass kind of influx of, of uh, COVID families uh, up from Brooklyn, and uh, he and Nikki have become you know great friends of of um, of Carrie and me personally. My Carrie, not the, I don't know if you guys are, <laughs> but it, he, seriously, um, we work together at the exchange nearly on a daily basis. Uh, joining that, uh, he was uh, not hesitant at all to jump in with the school board service, not really even knowing what that entailed, and uh, to join the finance committee as well. So he, he jumped in with two feet. Jay's uh, had some some work commitments that have taken a lot more time than he could have uh, anticipated when he joined the board. And we completely understand that it's um, you, know, you made the decision to move on, but we really appreciate everything you've done while, while you've been here. Thanks, Ben. Thank appreciate that. And uh, the third person, um, as you've already heard, is uh, Jim Half. Jim Half is a warrior from Killington. Um, I taught his kids. Um, I went to school board meetings when Jim was um, on the board, and he um, it has a great heart that um, I know well from having served with him on the Buildings and Grounds um, Committee. He chaired it well. He pushed very hard for improvements to all of our schools. And a lot of capital projects have been done in the past several years due to Jim's uh, pushing and his support of uh, both Joe and the buildings and grounds, folks who work in our schools who take care of things and have had quite a lot to deal with in the last two years with our buildings. Um, I just want to thank you, Jim. Um, we don't always agree. But we always get along, and I appreciate who you are. And now Ben has some things to say as well. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. When I got on the board, what five years ago uh, or so, um, there was uh, an item. I don't remember where I saw it, but it was um, somebody talking about being frustrated with 
national politics. And if you if you think that you know the country is going to hell in a handbasket uh, and there's nothing that we can do about it to change it, we'll get involved locally, right? And um, I, I joined the school board. I don't remember if I was on the board then or not, but it, it was never more true. Um, what that author said at the time was, because when you get involved locally, you actually have to meet people on their terms. You have to deal with differences that you might have and work things out. Really? And I, <laughs> and I, there's nobody who's more different than me, I think, on the story <laughs> than, than Jim Hat, right? But, um, and I was, you know, I was thinking last night, we were at the, the Thompson Senior Center Gala, and I was thinking, gosh, you know, I, I joined, I was young, and my kids are just joining the thing, and Jim's kids are now rolled off. And you know, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was great. Just put this thing, Jim, on the place to get lunch. This is awesome. But uh, just a little roast. Uh, no, but that, that's the thing, though. So I, I joined the finance committee, and Jim's on the finance committee. He taught me more about uh, the finances that run this place than anybody else ever could have, right? Even though we didn't see eye to eye on things. And in the course of, of um, you know, many frustrating meetings, there's times where I'm sure he was tearing his hair out, I was tearing mine out, but we met eye to eye, right? And I didn't realize how much I cared for this guy before uh, he got into a, a, a car crash, right, this year. And um, I was I was really concerned. And I was, I was texting you, I was like, man, are you all right? And when I saw you come back to the board meetings, um, I couldn't. Uh, there are very few things that's happened as a member of the board that made me happy to see that you're okay. Thank you. And um, I'm, you know, your time here, you've, you've been a great example to, to all of us, just um, sticking with it through thick and thin. And uh, I really appreciate everything you've done. Thanks a lot. Bryce? Oh, my God. Hey, Hang out a little bit. Yeah. I, I just, I just want to say that um, similar, but a little bit different. I think that, like, Jim and I actually probably agree on 85% of, of, of what goes on. I think that we have a slightly different delivery and approach. <laughs> I think that uh, for those of you that, I mean, Jim, Jim can talk, and for those of you that know me, uh, I can too. And there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of times where we're on the phone trying to talk over each other, I think. Not a quarrel. Uh, <laughs> uh, I kind of, kind of, kind of started out one way that seemed like an argument, but by the end, we kind of realized we're both saying the same thing, but but just coming at it from a different angle. Um, so I, I, I will miss you on the gym board, on the board, Jim, and I still sit next to him, even even through all these years we've been on this together. So. And it looks like Melania, you'd like to say something. Well, no, look older, yeah. not older. I'm sorry, Melania. Walmart. Still a board member. Yeah, you're muted, sweetie. You're muted. Sorry, I'm sorry. And I should know better than to raise my hand right now, but I took a chance. So thank you. I just I wanted to say thank you to Jim because I learned so much on the board with you, Jim. And so thank you. Thank you for everything you taught me when I was on the board. And um, you care so much. So thank you. And you will be missed. So thank you. I got I got real appreciation as well. We got one for every year. Yeah. I've gotten to know Jim uh, better over the past few years as he's been uh, chair of the building the grounds committee. And uh, what I can tell you about Jim is that uh, he's a tireless advocate for his community. The man has vision, determination. You know, folks talk about doing things, Jim Hap does things. So regardless if you love Jim Hap or love to hate Jim Hap, he uh, he gets the job done. And uh, I take him on my team any day. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Hey, Joe, want to check this bag out? <laughs> well, thanks, Joe. We're going to get right into what? We are moving um, into our second public comment time. So if there are folks here who uh, or on Zoom who wish to speak now, who didn't in the beginning session, uh, please either raise your Zoom hand or... Raise your hand here. I'd like to raise my hand as a public member. I have to go over there and sit. No, you don't have to do that, Jim. I like to say, I've been on this 
started off in the middle school, high school board when we were in a unified district. We've gone through, we went through a lot then. We're going through stuff now. You know, you have a group of people here that do listen. Um, you know, I can assure you that the staff may be upset with administration and staff. They have their heart into it also. Um, things will change, things will happen. The board will make sure it happens. And, um, you know, at times, you know, a board member may have to go against the rest of them or whatever, but even still then, someone needs to step up and at least say something and you have to get her off of what you want to say. And just like I keep on saying, I'm a big boy. If you vote me down, I vote it down. That's the process, folks. You know, and you just got to do what you think is best for not you, not your kids. You have to do what you think is best for the school. I'll bring up Garen. I mean, he was the principal of the middle school, high school. Garen, remember when it was just... I remember just us, you. you know, and we had that one little thing. My daughter, I'm going to give a quick story since everybody else is talking. <laughs> my daughter was in France for a semester. You remember this story, I think. Remind me. She had like a 96 and a half GPA going, um, coming back from 11th grade into 12. My daughter thought at the time that your GPA to get to whatever that cassage is, the goal, whatever, you know, you had to have a 97 average to go. She thought it was to the end of the third marking period. Um, she got to the 97 in the third marking period. Then she was told that it was to the half a year from someone, not Karen, but it was half a year and everything was already figured out. This was there. They got all their stuff right like two weeks before school was closing. They did all their practicing for graduation. She was upset that day. I put a phone call into the principal, Mr. Schnell, and I said, give me a call. And I was a board member and I was not going in there for my daughter. It was a lesson for everybody else here. I didn't go in for my daughter. I was saying, if that's the rule, then that's the rule. But my daughter's graduating this year, and I will come back at you next year for the rest of the students because that's not fair. It should be all the way through the end of the senior year, the GPA. So they, Garen, moved six students when we went to that graduation. Six students had the goal. I don't even know what it's called because I never graduated from high school. I just moved on later on. But walked through, he moved them up front. And then there were two other students that made it the last day of school. And they couldn't get into the paper because they made it the last day of school. But Mr. Smell stood up there in front of the whole assembly and pointed those two students out and they came in their regular spot. And ever since that day, they do it to the end of the school year. So there are, that's just one instance of, you gotta stick up for your kids. So just like you folks are doing. So I understand it, you know? So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Jim. Um, we do have- I did graduate, that was just a joke. <laughs> we, do, we do have somebody with the Zoom hand up, but I'm afraid your your phone it says iPhone. So could you identify yourself and your community, please? We in public. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're talking about me, but I'm Anna Spalding. I live in Bridgewater, but my stepdaughter goes um, to Woodstock, and I have uh, kids in the Heartland and Hartford School District. Um, I. I hear everybody's concerns and I'm concerned as well, but, and a lot of people are saying, I don't really know what the answer is, which is very valid because there isn't one specific answer, but just experiencing other school districts, um, the Heartland School puts out a lot of parent student engagement surveys 
um, via email. It's never a super long survey, but I just feel like it sounds like parents have their own personal um, experiences as well as their students that are not feeling safe. So I think the best way to try and figure out maybe where to start or what direction to go in could be sending out one of those surveys and just feeling what the pulse is of the community. Um, obviously right now it's a lot of frustration and tension, but if you give somebody a survey to fill out at home where they can decompress, then maybe you'd get some good feedback in regards to what direction the school or should go in and what programs should be implemented or I, I just feel like it's a good starting point. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I'd like to make a comment. Okay. Um, so earlier after the first open session, there was um, talk about um, discussing some of those things, those topics in the executive session. And I just wanted to draw the board's attention to Vermont statute 313, which outlines the reasons a public body may use executive session. Um, some of the topics brought up are definitely appropriate for that. Um, school safety measures that could jeopardize safety if they were discussed publicly. Most of the other ones are things like real estate deals, litigation, things like that, right? Um, the, you know, one thing that is not on there would be um, general issues of, of disruption in the classroom or discipline not pertaining to particular students. So I'd like to ask the board to keep that in mind. And if there are, um, you know, discussions about the tools available to teachers in the classroom or the disciplinary practices in general, that those should be held in open session. Thank you. And I'd just like to point out that that's the reason why it says an executive session, it's for student matter, it's not the overall classroom. Okay. Uh, Brian Townsend? Yeah. I'd just like to add, although I already had a chance to speak, uh, for the past two hours, I haven't heard any issues with going to school, the middle school, the high school, or Frost Rattle. And all the incidences I have heard are all along the bullying. So although transparency is key, especially with this hot topic, I think the bigger issue is the amount of bullying that goes on and is not adequately taken care of or in a proper manner. And it seems to be a quite the majority of our children are experiencing it at a very young professional age. I beg of you guys to look into it and please change it. Thank, Thank you. you. Valerie? I think that that goes back to the PBIS discipline order. And the reason why we're having so many disciplinary problems is the kids that do need PBIS and will benefit from it are maybe benefiting from it. The kids that do not need PBIS are looking at these kids and thinking, oh, you know, they get rewarded. Their misbehavior gets rewarded. It's almost showing them that it's easier and more beneficial to misbehave than it is to actually do the right thing. So now you're creating an environment where almost every kid is misbehaving and it's out of control. I've talked to people that teach in um, Massachusetts and Connecticut, and they saw the exact same problems with PBIS and they chose to get rid of PBIS and their schools have flourished. I really, really suggest that we look into that because these behaviors are starting small and they're growing with the child. Please just consider something else because whatever we're doing is not working. Thank you. Um, somebody has their Zoom hand up. Is it Kathy Peters? Yes. Kathy Peters? Hi, uh, Kathy Peters from Pomford again. Just so um, to the mention of executive session, and using student matters, you can speak to the student matters, but all these comments that we're discussing are not privy under executive session. So your hour and a half discussion needs to only be about private matters, not about all these discussions because they need to be discussed in open because they are not, they're not part of that exemption. This is open matters that have been discussed in public and need to be continued to be discussed in public and that executive session exemption does not apply to them. It only applies to student information. And those few very limited bullet points in that 313 statute. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, rights? No. I, I just, I mean, I, I, I just wanted to comment that I think that just uh, for a point of reference, um, this is the first board meeting that we've held since the incident in question. Um, so this is the first time that the board gets to hear of an incident from like the administration, whenever this type of thing happens. So you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk, emails potentially, just keep in mind to members of the public and especially because some of you are gonna hang out um, that that we've heard from, from members of the public and then we have to hear from the administration. So generally speaking, an executive session like this would be a time when we're hearing for the first time the administrative side of things. Thank you. Anybody else? Wishes to speak. All right, then at this time, I think um, we. I'd like to make a motion to go into the executive session at 847, 847, 6, 846, for a student matter. All right, so we will uh, thank you again for yes, your time. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mary. To I will make a motion the... at 10.09 to exit out of executive session and go back into public session. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do you want to admit those people that are sitting? Yeah, are you sitting out there? No, we've got people in the like, I'd like to say that this is like one of the few executive sessions that we're coming out of and not saying no action taken. Take it from there. So the, the board is um, directing the superintendent to prepare a presentation on safety and training of administration, as well as an overview of the PBIS system. We are also seeking uh, more transparency in the data collection. We are directing the superintendent to investigate the need for more administrative personnel or reallocation of current personnel at West. We will be scheduling a future open meeting to go forward and continue to uh, take next steps. There is also a parent student survey going out very shortly that was already ready to go. And the policy committee will be meeting next week on February 13th to begin drafting policy around communication and safety. Did I forget anything? Got it. Move to All adjourn. Right. I give a reflection. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, we have to reflect. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's I'm tired. reflect. It was a long awesome. evening, and I thank everybody for their patience and for um, listening well and 
um, understanding the complex needs of the world that we're living in, particularly around education. Well, we could have done better. We could have. Well, Knowing me for 12 to 15 years, I've never had a cup of coffee, but thank you for the cup. My wife will love it. <laughs> All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. Bob? Bob, did yeah. you make it? I moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you all. Stay well.